It's wonderful to be with you this morning. Uh, if you have a Bible, if you would, open up to the book of Titus, chapter 1. We've been working our way through the book of Titus over the last few months, but we finished our verse-by-verse, chapter-by-chapter study. There's only three chapters in, the, in, the, in that book of the Bible. But today, um, just going to share a little bit of feedback, both in general, because there is a little bit of feedback, if you can hear that. But even just a little bit of feedback in the sense of kind of what is the heartbeat of this book as we've just finished it. It really is a joy to be with you this Sunday morning. You know, my mornings are unique. You say, what do you mean by that? Well, there's only one of me. So my experience in the morning is probably different than yours. That's all that makes it unique. <clears throat> but on Thursday morning, my father and I were scheduled to be on a 6 a.m. flight. Now, for me, that's wonderful. You know, I'm an early riser. Any other, anyone else would kind of say, ah, yeah, I have that problem too, or that blessing. Your spouse would say, they have that problem. You'd say, I have that blessing. But, um, well, here's what happened. My dad said, Neil, I'm going to pick you up at 4.30. We'll be at the airport. I said, okay, great. Sounds good. Pulls up to my driveway at 4.30, shoots me a text here. And this is how I responded, just like that. No response. So he's like, huh, that's weird. I'm an early riser. He's like, oh, maybe he actually said, I thought maybe you were out on your bike or something and hadn't come back yet, because that's my dynamic. And um, he calls, same response. He's a very patient man. He knows that I have six children, so he doesn't go and knock on the door. Or he's just like, well... And then my wife's alarm goes off at 4.45. And I go, is that your alarm? She goes, yeah. I said, let me look at my phone. Oh, I was supposed to be in the car 15 minutes ago. <laughs> this is unique to me. Why is this unique to me? Because about two weeks and three days ago, I had another dynamic of sclerotherapy. Anyone ever had sclerotherapy? Oh, maybe you don't want to announce that. Maybe you do. I don't know. I've had it. I've had it. I'm OK. I'll, I'll tell you what I have. Um, for 25 years, I've navigated venous reflux, if you know what that is. And if you don't, you are blessed and highly favored among, among those that God loves. Um, simply just means that things don't work as they could vascularly. And so I have dents and scratches, so to speak, in my vascular dynamics that need to be buffed out through sclerotherapy. Well, I would say f for most of at least the last 15 years, I've had pain behind my right knee that keeps me from sleeping through the night. So that's why I'm awake. I haven't had to set an alarm since I don't know when. But here's what happened. The sclerotherapy alleviated some of that pain. So I slept. And I was like, what's an alarm? You know, like the alarm went off. It's like, oh my goodness. Why do I share that with you? Well, this morning I woke up on time by the grace of God. And yeah, someone almost clapped. Like, thank God. <laughs> I was like, what the? Um, but I sent this message to some friends of mine who are connected to Calvary Chapel locally, regionally, nationally, and internationally. This is what I sent. Good morning. Happy Sunday. Praying for everyone everywhere who will gather together in community to love and worship Jesus as we hear the gospel preached. That's why we're here. To sing and serve and give and pray and fellowship and learn the word and perhaps take communion and celebrate baptism. There were 10 things that were just said there. They are the 10 values of this church. They were discovered in scripture, not determined by a leader. Appreciate your prayers for us at Coastline. Today is our first of three services. Or today is our first three service Sunday since September 12th, 2004, 20 years ago. You see, 20 years ago tomorrow, Hurricane Ivan. Anyone remember that? 20 years ago tomorrow, Hurricane Ivan changed things, a lot of things. Four years ago tomorrow, Sally. Anyone remember Sally? Yeah. 43 years ago tomorrow, me. Yeah. <laughs> the same day. And no one, no one around here likes that day. They know they're like, that day. Like, I know Shannon, my cousin, she, her first daughter, same birthday, like, me and Aubrey, nobody likes us. But, um, but here's the point. I think that God is faithful. Would you agree to that? I think he's faithful through storms, 
when it's warm, when it's cold. Um, he's faithful. You know, I was talking to Paul a uh, few minutes ago. Paul's here. He said, do you know why I sit right where I sit every single Sunday? That's how I responded. I don't know. I mean, tell me. Well, because 25 years ago, the day after tomorrow, that's where I stood and got married. And your father officiated that wedding right where I, because the building used to end right where he's sitting. So he, he intentionally sits there. And this is why that's so endearing, because obviously the man cares about his marriage. That's endearing. But also he's in a situation where he's the reason we changed the rows. See, so what do you mean by that? It's not like we didn't want him to sit there anymore. Hey, sorry again. But it was like, you know, if you have a camera and there's individuals at home that can't come here and they look at an aisle that's empty, it's a subconscious way to still feel disconnected. But if the camera comes in and they see the back of someone's head, and you can, if you're sitting there, you can wave to them. It, it's like this subconscious, there you go, thank you. They, it's like this, I'm a part. I know it's subtle. I know it doesn't, does it, is it in the Bible? You have to, no. But could it help someone who can't come on a Sunday morning, who, who watches every Sunday, his bride of 25 years, feel just a little bit more connected? Yes. And will it alleviate a storage problem that we have in the facility? Yes, those are sitting in storage. So everyone wins. Except for those that are like, I don't like that middle aisle. Well, do you like people that could maybe be better connected to church? That's why they were there. But happy anniversary, Paul and Delana. We're very thankful for you guys. 25 years. That's awesome. So also, I would say, 1983 to 1997, New Life Christian Fellowship. 1997 to 2011, Calvary Chapel Gulf Breeze. 2011 till now and however long, Coastline Gulf Breeze. And it reminds me a little bit of Titus chapter 1, verse 5. Let me read it to you out of the New Living and the New King James. The New Living puts it this way. Paul speaking to Titus, I left you on the island of Crete so you could complete our work there. There's stuff to do. And appoint elders in each town I instructed you. Listen to how the New King James puts it. For this reason, I left you in Crete so that you should set in order the things that are lacking and appoint elders in every city as I commanded you. I believe in the 80s and 90s, New Life Christian Fellowship. Was anyone here when that was the name of our fellowship? I know these two were, right? There. Yeah. New Life, I was here. New Life Christian Fellowship. Calvary Chapel Gulf Breeze. Anyone here during that era? Okay. Anyone here during the era of coastline? You all are a part of that. God has been faithful. God raised up the middle child of a family, first one born here in Pensacola in 1953, to start a church in his hometown. And countless numbers of individuals and families who served. I can't tell you how many people have been a part of New Life, Calvary Chapel, and Coastline. I don't know. We were somewhere yesterday, West Palm Beach, and this guy comes up to my dad and he goes, hey, I used to go to Mark Swift's church in Columbus, Georgia. And this other lady goes, I, was, I lived in Gulf Breeze. I'm like, Gulf Breeze? Like the church, of, or the town of 5,000? You you're from there? Wow, that's amazing. Um, God's been faithful through our founding pastor and countless families and individuals who've served and led to just simply do what Titus was told to do. Hey, finish the work there. Raise up people. Make sure things are together. You know, I remember when my dad said, you know, when we first started the church, some people were so upset because we had to have chairs. I said, what do you mean? What? They, they didn't want to have chairs? No, they wanted it to be super informal. No chairs? Nope, they don't want it. It's like, well, Titus says set things in order. I think it's okay to have chairs. How many of you would agree? Thank God for chairs. Like, who cares how they're organized? At least they're here. You know, like... Um, but that's the deal. You see, Titus is there to work in it and work on it. If you have a home, you know what that's like. If you have a marriage, you know what that's like. I need to be in my marriage, but we also have to always be, always be building. He was there to establish and to build. 
There were essentially, essentially, it, there are more you could say, but crucial needs, order, leadership. But from where? A place of grace. You ever been in a place that's ordered and there's leadership and you go, I don't really like it here. This is tough. The people are not very nice. Order and leadership are not bad. They're, they're like the lattice to the organism that is the church. Jesus is the vine, we're the branches. But structure, order, it just kind of helps make sure the fruit doesn't have to be on the ground. In fact, you could organize the entirety of this little letter, chapter one, how to set up true leaders and how to deal with bad ones. I don't know if you've noticed this. There is such a thing as a bad leader. Have you ever experienced that? Have you ever lived in America? Like, I mean, like, there's such a thing everywhere. Like, sometimes I'm a bad leader. Sometimes you might be. I mean, no one bats a thousand. But how many of you would agree that leadership matters? Like, it matters. It matters. So chapter 1, 2, and 3 are about how to kind of identify this is a healthy leader, this is not. And this is how leaders should live in response to the gospel, chapters 2 and 3. See, we have a screen that we're going to put up in just a second. This was the title of our series. It was all about, starts with a J, ends with an S. Jesus. How to live, love, and lead like that's what this book shows you, Titus. If you're like, what does it look like to love and live and lead like Jesus? Read Titus. It'll help. And Paul says to Titus, you are there to put things that remain in order. How many of you guys have had or at least known someone who's had a medical appointment in the last year? I, uh, to set things in order is a medical term. I mean, I... We actually made our flight that morning by the grace of God, but I, was, I wasn't unthankful for the extra sleep, I'm going to be honest with you, because things were set in order. Oh, my leg doesn't hurt. I can actually sleep. That was great. My dad didn't like it, but, I mean, it was great. You know, it all worked out. Um, the phrase is a medical term applied to setting of a crooked limb. Did you know that that's what happens to anything that's living that doesn't, experience maintenance. It's not just what you strive to attain that has to be maintained. Everything attained has to be maintained. Everything. Do you know what alignment is in a car? You will if you don't. Or weeds. You know what that is? You will. You know, you'll find out. Do you know what loneliness is like in a marriage? You don't have to. Do you know what it's like to read the Bible and make it feel like you're just reading words on a page? You don't have to. It's consistency that wins the day. The, the root word of disciple is discipline. We are not saved by our discipline. We're saved because Jesus, the ultimate one who was disciplined, I guess you could say, to fulfill the law completely said, I will take their place. You don't get into heaven because of what you know or how you performed. You get into heaven because of who you know. And better yet, who knows you? You show up there and he goes, I know that guy. You can bring him on in. In life, it's all about who you know, both temporally and eternally. But here's what I've found. People that actually begin to know God they recognize the best way I can love him is just to, okay, he put it this way. If you love me, you would obey my commandments. So what does love look like? Um, it rhymes with obedience. That's what it looks like. Love to God looks like a lifestyle where you say, God, whatever you say. If this is what marriage is to look like, that's what it looks like. If this is what my finances are to look like, okay. But how could you know? How are you going to know what finances should look like? Family, friendships. Don't you wish there was a church that every single day helped you get to know this? 
See, daily in the word ends on September 30th. We're done. We did it. We went through the whole New Testament and the whole Old Testament. Malachi will be done September 30th. We'll have completed it. But we'll have something for October 1st. We'll have just gone through our first season through providing a daily devotional through the word. You are afforded more opportunity to know God through his word than any other generation before you. Um, I would highly encourage you to sit in that for a second. Huh. My, one of my professors once said, Neil, you know as much about God as you want. Because there is no mediator between God and man. And here this is. That was extremely convicting. Because I thought it had everything to do with IQ. He goes, no, Neil. No. It has everything to do, and I'll put it in my own language. The NIV, Neil's interesting version. Has less to do with IQ. You have to know at least how to read, I guess, or listen. You know, at least hear it. It has more to do with EQ. Where is my heart? Where is my willingness to put my hands and allow it to follow what this says? See, when your IQ is EQ, that's when you become GQ. That's how that works. Like, oh, that looks good. Yeah, because your IQ has been EQ'd. And your EQ is IQ'd. That's why you're GQ. Does that make sense? That doesn't make sense. But the point is, Titus was there. Because he loved God. His life had been changed. And so Paul sets him on mission. He's there to set things in order to help. He's there to disciple. Now I'll make a confession. I have addictions. Here's one of them. Alliteration. As a discipler there, he is called to help individuals discover, discern, develop, and deploy a love-based relationship where they're functioning in their giftings. Do you know how God has wired and gifted you? What, what you waiting for? Would you like to find out? Somebody much smarter than me once said, there's two most important days in your life. The day you're born, and then the day you find out why and how. Oh, this is how I'm wired. This is what lights me up. So then maybe that's how God wants to use me. Did you know that God is not the great bummer? That he has put within you a calling giftings, abilities that he wants to use for his glory and the good of others. Did you know that when fruit is produced, it's not intended for the vine? It's for someone else. And that's when life gets fun. We're like, man, I've got, I'm fruitful, so I'll just hoard it. That's miserable. No, I'm fruitful, and I can't wait to give it away. And then God goes, oh, I can, I can give you more. I can give you more. I can give you more. One of the guys that wrote the second best-selling book in existence said, every year I made it an aim to give a little bit more to God than I did last year. And he said, now I live on 10% and I give away 90. And he said, any job I ever had, I paid them all back. I didn't want to be in anyone's debt. And he said, because I made this little silly rhythm in my life. God, I will give everything to you that I can. It's yours. And he said, that's why God entrusted me with the best-selling book in the world except the Bible. Because he can trust me to give. Those that water shall themselves be watered. Those that give shall be given to. And then you learn, like, I don't really need anything. I have food. I have clothes. The air is conditioned. I'm good. You see, they're there to... Be developed. Well, who? Okay, more alliteration. Those who are called have character, have chemistry, case, ca capacity, and capability to serve and lead. You see, here's the, here's the reality. You are, and this may be, you know, some people may disagree. I think this is the way. But you are a leader. You are. The very first thing God gave you stewardship over is you. The temple. Like, you are responsible for you. Jeremiah, the prophet, was used by God to tell the people of God, stop saying your teeth are set on edge because your parents ate sour grapes. Meaning, hello, today is today. 
This is where you're alive. Let yesterday go. Let it die. Good or bad. Don't live there. And don't live out here where you don't know. This is where you are. Just like you, I, I know more than one person in life. Just like you. And the more people I meet, here's what I'm finding every year after year after year. It seems to get less and less and less. People that know how to be in the present moment. Less and less. They're so concerned about the feed that they're getting that it's, it's, it's motivating where they are now because they're thinking about what could be or what's happening somewhere else that has no impact on you. It's very rare to meet a person who's actually with you, like listening to what you're saying, able to respond in a conversation. It's almost becoming a lost art. If I were your enemy, that would be my tactic too. Because it's when you're alive in the moment, when you are alive. And that's the secret to life, to live. Where can you live? Yesterday? No. Tomorrow? No. Now. If you've ever read the book of Hebrews, one of the themes is that God is the ever-present God of now. Now. He's always in the moment. Over space and time. He's the only one that can do that. But that's what it looks like for you as a created being. To look like your creator. To be right where you are. Where yesterday is history, tomorrow is a mystery. That's why today is a gift called the present. You know Ugwe from Kung Fu Panda. That's from him. But it is true. To live is Christ, to die is gain. Titus is there to work in and work on, to set things in order. No church has ever arrived. No individual ever has. There's always more to grow and learn and develop. Titus is there to appoint leaders. If you read through the rest of the chapter... He describes the kind of leaders that, that they're, they're to be, people that are elders. What does that mean, that they have that title? No. It means that there's maturity in spirit. He, he says overseer or bishop. What does that mean? The ability to oversee something. And then pastor. Is that a noun? Can be. In Scripture, it's more often used as a verb. It can be a noun. In the American culture, it is. But in, in language... It's often used as a verb, not to say that there's not nouns, but do they care? Do they care? Is there compassion? Is there capability? Is there chemistry of maturity? There's your leader. Um, you can do that over time, at least for yourself. You can say when it's like hot donuts now, no, I have led myself. I have stewarded my physical health. Just one donut. See, my problem is if I look at a donut, I begin to look like a donut. That's my physically logical situation. But you steward yourself. You do. And I, I'm going to share this with you. I came from a really good family. And also, there's no such thing as a functional family. Every family has an element of dysfunction. There's no human that's functioning spiritually, physically, emotionally, relationally, mentally, a thousand. No one. Everyone has shortcomings. Everyone has blind spots. So does a church, because all a church is is individuals together. And see, this is the encouraging thing. Paul tells Titus, you've got to have leaders because there's this dynamic that they constantly need help. You know, like I shared with you, tomorrow I turn 43, and you know what I'm going to do on my 43rd birthday? Uh, clean my garage. You know why? Because we have six children, and they have bikes and an insane amount of trash with six, hum six eight humans. And in our neighborhood, maybe this isn't like your neighborhood, but we can't put our trash cans outside anymore. There's these things called bears, and if the trash cans are out, then they're everywhere. So it's like, well... It's just a day goes by, I gotta set things in order. I gotta set things in order. I gotta set things in order. You know why? Because there's life there. I would much rather have life than a garage that always stays in order. How about you? Every T and every I? 
Or would you rather be alive? Doesn't mean it's not orderly. But I know a lot of dead things that are organized. Like when you go to a cemetery, there's order there. No change. Everything living costs. And anything that's going to move forward costs time, energy, effort, resource. Why is there so much emphasis on who leads? Let me read to you an excerpt from an article I read. The reputation of the gospel in the community and the health of the church, listen to this, are dependent, obviously, first and foremost upon God. But who does God use? Godly, qualified men who keep in step with Jesus and who can lead the church to do likewise. He's speaking specifically there of elders. But don't, don't male and female complement one another in every single way? Like in a marriage, you complement one another. There's one that's more dominant, like a hand. You, if you read the Bible, the structure of a church, the structure of a home, there is order in the way that it relates to male, female roles and responsibilities to complement one another. Complement one another. Like, let me just share something with you. I'll give you a real life example. This week, I thought we should add two dogs to our family. That's where I was. And my wife goes, no. I was like, oh, well, okay. She had a better EQ. Does that make sense? No, Neil, we're not doing that. Like, oh, really? We have, we have six kids. They, they all have roommates. They could each have a dog in the room. You know, that's what I was thinking. She's like, no, Neil. No, 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 no. Thank God for a complementarian relationship. Amen? I would have, this morning, I'm like, I can't come to church. We got two new dogs. Like, <laughs> um, you see, here's the deal. Paul speaks in verse 6, 7, 8, and 9 about the heart, the head, and the hands of these leaders. If you'd like a message on this, I'd encourage you to go on our website. Pastor John gave a phenomenal message on this passage. But he speaks to the heart of these leaders. Their families in order, verse 6. Their personal character, verses 7 and 8 of chapter 1. Pastor Chuck Smith used to say that the battle of the flesh and the spirit is waged on the warfare of the mind. And they have ability. Verse 9 just says they have a preaching ability. They're able to do it. And this isn't siloed to Titus. It's also in the Old Testament. If you've ever been through our first steps class that was mentioned today in the announcements, we share with you, what does it look like to love, connect, and live on mission as a person? See, th these words are, are our process. We gather to love and worship God. We group to connect, and we go to live on mission. But they're also our personal purpose. You say, what do you mean by that? Loving God? We love God because he's mean, and we need to love him or else he's going to come and get us, right? Romans 5.8 says that God demonstrates his own love that when we were still sinners, Christ died for us. John chapter 3, verse 16 says that God doesn't love you. He so loves you. <laughs> God so loved the world that he gave his one and only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Listen, you need to know in your bones that God loves you. He is not against you. And if you ever experience God's correction in your life, you're like, man, I'm trying to do this and it doesn't work. It's because God loves you. Have you ever met a two-year-old? Some of you. Okay, yes. They need correction by the grace of God and in a loving way. But they don't need influence. I was somewhere recently where I don't know that this parent understood that. This parent was like, would you like to sit here or here or here or here? And the, and the two-year-old was like, over here. Oh, okay. Well, would you like to stop crying and screaming in the midst of this big crowd? Or a two-year-old, hmm, I don't know. See, a two-year-old needs leadership, correction, encouragement, structure. But I also have teenagers. They also need structure. They also need correction. Don't misunderstand. But as they age, here's what I'm learning as a parent. The relational currency needs an exchange from control to influence. And each human is different when that happens. Where eventually, I'll go like this. Hey, Liam. Hey, he might be taller than me. He's a tall kid. 
I think we should do this. What do you think? You know, when he's 25 or something. There will be this necessity of him saying, hey, I respect that. Here's the funny thing about my dad. Between the age of 18 and 21, somehow, I don't know how this happened for my dad. He got a lot smarter in my eyes. Between 18 and 20, I was like, man, how'd that guy get so smart all of a sudden? Like three years ago, he wasn't, but now he's like, wow, he's really grown. Good job, dad. Like, no, you understand what I'm saying, right? Like the influence relation. Okay, I'm going to listen to you now because now I've learned a little bit. Like, oh, yeah, you were right. I was not. Okay, what do you think about this? And that's what you want, a relationship of influence. That will never happen if you don't hold the line when they're 2, when they're 10, when they're 12, when they're 15, sometimes when they're 22. But do you understand what I'm saying? God loves you enough to bring correction. God loves you enough to say no to that relationship, no to that opportunity. I was in a church this week where very rapidly the pastor um, stepped into a church where the founding pastor died unexpectedly. And I had been with this pastor on a trip earlier this year, and I said, hey, how come you didn't tell me that you were going to transition like two months after we got off this trip? He said, Neil, I didn't know. Like the pastor found out about the, the severity of his health on Monday, he was in heaven on Saturday. And I was already scheduled to guest teach for him, and then they just said, will you be our pastor? And he's like, well, I guess this is my new life. And so, like, that's what happened to him. But see, right before that, he was trying to get into a new building, and it got turned down. And one of the guys in his church said, man, he was just crushed. He's like, God, I don't understand. Like, we need a new space, and it's just, he said no. Six months later, here you go. This one's all paid for. Like, oh, well, thank God. You know, <laughs> God sees the end from the beginning and the beginning to the end. He's the one in the drone. You're, you're like a drone sometimes. You know, so he's, he's in the drone. So trust him. Trust him. You only see what you can see. You only have senses, taste, sight, sound, so on. How much do you really think you can know? You're not the creator. You're the created. When you know your place, I can trust him. He loves me. So my closeness to him, my character, my calling, my ability to love people, my, 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 my heart to just with my attitude and actions live on mission for him. Like, like Brother Lawrence of old, if you've never read the book, Practicing the Presence of God about a dishwasher in a monastery who led a revival because of the way he washed dishes, you need to read it. He wasn't an orator or a musician, or a writer. He was a dishwasher who said, this is what God's called me to, and I'm going to do it with joy. I'm going to do it with excellence. And a revival broke out. Why isn't revival happening yet? Maybe you're not washing the dishes well enough, men. You know, like, maybe that's the problem. Like, maybe whatever our hand finds it to do, we should do it well and do it with joy. And people would go, why do you wash the dishes so well? Well, let me tell you, there's this guy named Jesus, and he loves dishwashers. You know, like, oh, you see, here's what I wanted to say as we close. I believe that God is faithful and he's worthy of my trust. And in my life and in my experience, he's the faithful one. He's the one that I've come to over and over and over and again and said, I don't understand this. Help me. Please. And he is faithful to be a friend when there is not one. To be present when there isn't anybody else. To provide when I don't know how to help it. To give creativity when I'm like, that, uh, I'm flat. I don't know. Lord, help me. See, I really resonate with that scripture. Paul wrote it. What is it? Galatians 2.20. The life I now live, I live by faith. And the power of the one who saved me. For I died. Colossians 3. And my life is now hidden in Christ and God. I don't ever want to go back to me driving or at least just having Jesus in the passenger seat. I'd rather just give him the whole car. 
Just say, pick me up when you want to, Jesus. It's just a bit better. I learned. I need him every hour of the day. I need him. I cannot do this without him. You say what? Just navigate this. I need him to calm an anxious mind. I need him for everything. I know what it's like to feel guilty, and I know what it's like to be forgiven. I know what it's like to be sad, and I know what it's like to have fun. I know what it's like to wish the day didn't come. And then I know what it's like to can't wait for the day to come. And the only thing that changed that for me is Jesus. And not a one-time prayer started there but learning to get to know him. That's when life started to get fun. I got to know this from here to here to here. That's when life was like, this is great. There's nothing comparable. I haven't found anything better than being walking in step with my creator. And I want to encourage you today as we close. I don't know, like, where has God called you? I know he's called you to steward the things that he's given you. Your own life, the relationships, the responsibilities, the roles, the remuneration you get from the things that you do. That means money. Um, the rhythms of your life. I'm addicted to literator. I have to, you know, your schedule, you know, things like that. Um, you are. God's placed you in your sphere of influence. Every hundred years, it's different people, man. Like, I think who leads matters, but there is a kingdom that's so much bigger, so much grander than just the 120 years or so that this, this group might be around. Live for that by living here well in your business, in your service in the government, military, family. I think life is like probation. What I mean by that, it's your first 90 days to see what job description you'll get when it really matters. Live well. Because when you get to eternity, you'll get a new job description, so to speak. And I think we'll be surprised by the roles and dynamics that God gives. And my hope and heart for you is that you do well that you run your race to win. It's not in competition with anyone. Except the flesh, the world, and the devil. And as a Christian, although saved as an individual, you're not saved into individuality. You're saved into a community where as an individual, in a diverse context, there is unity, not uniformity. Not everyone wants to wear a $12 Etnies from Walmart, but if you're from the 90s, you're like, you got $12 Etnies from Walmart? You know what that is. You're like, what? Those used to be $50. But not some people are like, I would never wear that. That's okay. Unity and diversity. You can be wrong and not know what to do. I mean, that's fine. <laughs> I mean, but my point is, The hope of moving to three services is to help more people come to know Jesus. Now, we don't want every seat filled, every service. The only people that like that are the people on the stage, like the people leading the music, the people teaching. Look, it's a full room. Everyone else, I can't find a parking place. I can't find a place to see. There's not enough coffee. How come the toilet paper's out again? Nobody likes that. I got to sit right next to a person. I'm like a sardine in here. Like, nobody likes that. I don't like that. Do you like that? You go to a movie theater, like, oh, great. Everyone, there's a seat, one seat there, one seat there. Nobody likes that. So it's to make more room so more people can know Jesus and to show you, hey, there's, there's a person here that can know Jesus, a person here, a person here, a person here. Like, 32566, 32563, 32561, 32541, whatever zip code you're in, there are people that don't know Jesus. My wife and I have been married 17 years. We both grew up in, in a moral home. 
I grew up in a Christian one, but she grew up in a good moral home, I would say. But I remember when we first met, she'd only been a Christian for like a year, year and a half, maybe two. And I remember talking through passages in the Bible, and I don't know which one it is, so hopefully I don't embarrass you, CC, by this, but I'll just say a name, and then you can tell us if I'm wrong. But we'll just say, like, you know that story of whatever the story is, Moses or Noah or Jonah? And she's like, no, never heard it. What? Never heard it? What do you mean? Didn't you grow up in Florida? Yeah. Aren't you from Navarre? Doesn't everyone know the Bible in Navarre? Nope. I remember going to Pensacola Beach with my brother in 2008 doing a man on the street for Easter. Hey, tell us what you think about Easter. What's the first thing that comes to your mind? Why do we do Easter? And I remember one guy going, isn't it like the birth of Jesus or something? And some people, I don't know. And they're like, this is Pensacola Beach. This isn't Uganda. This isn't some far off place in the 1040 window that doesn't. These are your neighbors. These are the people at Walmart. These are the people that are widening our roads. And through attitudes and actions and words, you're preaching the gospel. Do it well this week. Like share. Help people know where life and love and connection and purpose are ultimately found. In Jesus. In Jesus. It's in Jesus. So just a couple things as we close. This week, I'd love to invite you to join us. And, and if you can help us even know what to talk about, we have an event on Friday night called Families of Faith. And at this event, we hope on Friday night to gather kids, students, and adults at this little gathering in this room and worship together. It's so fun when you have like 12-year-olds also leading us in worship with a 25 and a 45 and a 55-year-old, and that congregation is also expressed. And we're going to have a time for kids and students to have a connection point of their own in their own environments and a panel discussion that we're, we're hoping to answer questions that you're actually asking. Like, hey, as a family of faith or as a Christian, how do I navigate this dynamic? There, there's a table in the foyer where if you can help us be helpful in answering some of those questions and providing a resource website, we'd love for you to participate. Saturday morning, there'll be like an extended men's breakfast from 8.30 to 11.30. Well, there'll be a couple short teachings, one's from my father, where he's going to share, this is what it looks like to live faithful. Not that he's the shining example and never made a misstep, but let me just ask, how many of you would agree, oh yeah, he's an example of faithfulness? Yes. Uh, he's probably got a lesson or two he could share. In fact, yesterday we were sitting on the stage with some church planters and pastors, and they said, hey, we'd like to hear from John just because he's done ministry for almost over 40 years, still married to the same woman. His children are at least contributing members to society. Like, how did that happen? You know, like, those are, you think that that's not normal? That's not normal anymore, you know, like, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, so come, Friday night, Saturday. Also, Fall Fest. I don't know if you get this. Like, oh, man, my friend Christian from Romania, He's a new pastor in Panama City, and he was looking at this building to get that was, and he's like, oh, the Lord didn't open the door, but I just pray it's not another mosque. And I was like, wow, I never, what do you mean by that? He's like, well, if another Christian church gets it, I think that's just wonderful. He goes, you know, coming from Romania, like in, many things come in. And I was like, I don't even think like that. The ability to be in our local community and do a fall fest, that's a unique opportunity that we shouldn't take for granted. We get to go in our community and share and show the love of Jesus. We'd love for you to join it. This is a great way to build connections and community. Connect groups. Connect groups. We gather to love and worship, but we group to connect. I met a young lady this morning, I think it was this service, where she said, hey, where is the young adults ministry? Where do they sit? Where do I go? And I was like, oh, she needs to connect in a group. Come to a worship gathering, but also a group. We've got so many new things going on in our kids and student ministries. Last Sunday, we shared a little bit about that, how we hope to serve our community and our local church, how we hope to train our leaders, and how we hope to resource our parents. I'd love for you to pick one of these up. They're in the foyer at the student table. If you want to learn, like, well, who do I talk to? Here's the org chart. 
If you want to like, hey, I don't have a car, but I got a cool ride. Have you seen my bike? Like, I'm bringing it up here. Like, great, bring it up here. If you're like, man, I wish I had an invite, you know, that I could like share with people. Well, it's also a sticker. Like, who doesn't like that? Some people don't like stickers. I have found that out. But like, I like them. And so here you go, invite. My point is this. Let us know how we can come alongside you to pray with you, pray for you, celebrate what God's doing. But in the name of our Lord and Savior, also step into the calling God has on your life. Love him. Be with him. Be with his people. And where you're going to come most alive is in serving him. Your time, your talent, your treasure, you finally realize, oh, this isn't meant for me. <laughs> God's my provider, not my boss. I can trust if I give it away. God will take care of me. Don't, take, don't be un, in, irresponsible. But also, don't live a life that necessitates caution and clarity to move forward, but a life of faith. We are called to walk by clarity. No. We are called to walk by faith. And it's only those that choose to do that that are alive. If you seek to walk by clarity, go, okay, Lord, split that Red Sea and then we'll go. The Egyptians are coming for you. But if you go, Lord, this is what's in my hand, I'm going to trust you. That's how it works. In order to move forward, you have to uh, move forward. That's how it works. And I think God is bigger than any mistake or any bumbling or wrong turn. He can direct a moving car. But someone who just says, Lord, you got to show me. Black and white and sometimes red. He's shown you. He's shown you. Walk with him. Gather with his people. Group with his people. Go with his people. Because he has called you to steward and lead your life well. You will stand before God. You. And aren't you thankful? It's not about what you've done or what you know that gets you in. It's who you know. He, he said I could come in. Jesus. Didn't matter what I did. But, and also, read the Bible. There's rewards. I just want you to do well. It's not just about getting in. Run your race well. And if you're breathing, you still have some, some track to run. Run it at the appropriate pace, but run your ra race well. And may your motivation be, Lord, I just want to stand there and hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord.